Welcome to the New Books Network. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the New Books Network. My name is Kyle Johansson, I'm, and I'm one of the network's hosts. Uh, today, I'm very happy to be interviewing Dr. Melanie Joy. Melanie is an award-winning psychologist and the author of seven books. She is also the founding president of the international NGO Beyond Carnism. Today, we'll be discussing her book, How to End Injustice Everywhere, Understanding the Common Denominator, Driving All Injustices to Create a Better World for Humans, Animals, and the Planet. Uh, This book was published in 2023 by Lantern Publishing and Media. Welcome to the podcast, Melanie. Oh, hi. Thanks so much for having me. It's, it's, it's great to have you have you here, Melanie, uh, for, for the second time now, in fact. This is the, the yeah. second time that I'm I'm interviewing you for the New Books Network. Um, but for, for listeners who didn't hear our first interview or who just may not be familiar with you, I was hoping that you would tell us a bit about yourself, such as where you're from or, or what sort of work you do. Yeah, sure, sure. So um, I'm a psychologist, as you mentioned. Um, I specialize in relationships and communication and social transformation. Um, and I'm probably best known for my theories on the psychology of violence and nonviolence, um, which are also connected to my, you know, theories on and work around building healthy relationships, which we'll be talking about um, later today. Um, basically, I've, I've looked at, um, you know, and tried to help explain why it is that people, you know, who care about others, who care about the planet, who care about animals, nevertheless, very often engage in, in what I call non-relational behaviors, you know, behaviors that cause harm to other people, animals, the planet, and even themselves. And also, you know, the big question that, you know, really interests me the most is, you know, how do, how do we change this pattern? So that's, that's really what my work has, has looked at. I'm, best known for my book, Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs and Wear Cows, which is on the psychology of the human's relationship with uh, those animals we've learned to classify as edible. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm also the founding president, as you mentioned, of the international organization Beyond Carnism. Um, Where am I from? I'm American. I'm originally from the East Coast of the US, from Boston, actually. Um, But I've been living in Berlin, Germany for the past 10 years. And that's where I am right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, well, yeah. Thanks, Melanie. It's great to have you back. Um, Why did you decide to write this book? So this book, you know, really, it grew out, it was my seventh book. And um, it really, it grew out of my own personal experience. Um, as I mentioned, I was I was interested in originally, you know, when I first started doing my work and interested in the psychology of violence and, and nonviolence, um, I had, I'll tell you just a little bit about my personal story and how I came to write this book from that place. Um I grew up with, you know, like many people with a dog who I loved. And um, I also grew up eating animals. Um, I was always a person like most people who cared about animals and would never want to cause them to suffer, you know, especially when that suffering was so intensive and so completely unnecessary. And yet I grew up eating animals on a regular basis. And I, I never made the connection, you know, between the meat on my plate and the living being it once was, um, at least not for the first, you know, portion of my life. Um, In 1989, I had an experience that changed all of that. Um, I ate um, a hamburger that turned out to have been contaminated with Campylobacter, which is basically like the red meat version of salmonella. And I wound up extremely sick um, and hospitalized and on intravenous antibiotics. And after that experience, I actually stopped eating meat. And it wasn't out of any, at least not conscious sort of ethical decision. It was more like, you know, when you, the last thing that you've eaten, like makes you so sick, you're just disgusted by it. Mm -hmm. So it was just this sort of visceral reaction that I had. And so I became a vegetarian sort of by accident. And um, this was in 1989. So it was, fairly unusual um, for people to be vegetarian. It became vegan shortly thereafter. And, um, you know, as I was researching how to cook for myself, how to shop for myself, you know, I stumbled, not surprisingly, upon information about animal agriculture and what I learned shocked and horrified me. Like I just, I could not believe the extent of the harm and the suffering to farmed animals, um, to the environment, you know, and they didn't even know half of what they knew, they know today back then to human health, um, you know, and so on. And 
Uh, but what shocked me in some ways even more was that nobody I talked to about what I was learning was willing to hear what I had to say. And these were people like in my inner circles, right? They were rational people. They were compassionate people. The vast majority of them were really like left-leaning, progressive thinkers, really concerned with their impact on others, people who definitely cared about animals, loved their dogs, would never want to hurt harm animals. You know, but the response when I would just simply share what I was learning was always something along the lines of like, don't tell me that you'll ruin my meal, or they'd call me a radical, you know, vegan hippie propagandist. And I, I became very curious, you know, this was the question that was planted in my mind was how is it that caring people, you know, and rational people can engage in uncaring, irrational behaviors, um, without, fully really realizing what they're doing, like what causes people to shut down the conversation when it comes to an issue that's really critical to the well-being of ourselves, other beings, and our planet. And so this led me to pursue a doctorate in psychology. Um, and I studied the psychology of violence and nonviolence violence um, broadly. And then I narrowed down my focus to the psychology of eating animals. And that was what led me to identify what I came to call carnism, the invisible belief system that conditions people to eat certain animals. That's the opposite of veganism. And, you know, to really deconstruct the system to identify the mentality that is this mentality that becomes internalized, that distorts our perceptions and disconnects us from our natural empathy when it comes to those animals we've learned to classify as edible so that we act against our core values of compassion and justice and against our own interests and against the interests of others without even realizing what we're doing. And so... This led to my book, the writing of my book, Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs, and Wear Cows, as I, I think I mentioned. And um, what I had at the end of my research and after writing Why We Love Dogs and then doing work, you know, sort of building out the theory and expanding the theory and deepening my theory and the theory and understanding. And other people started conducting research around my theory of car carnism as well. You know, what I had after the research was actually sort of a blueprint for not simply the mentality that causes us to harm those animals we've learned to classify as edible, but the mentality that causes us to harm, causes us to harm others. The same mentality that drives us to harm farmed animals is the mentality that drives us to harm other humans, that drives us to harm, you know, people in our own personal circles, you know, not just on a societal level um, who we care about and might, you know, would otherwise not want to harm. It's the mentality that causes infighting in our movements for justice. So I, I realized that I had sort of a, a, a blueprint for what I later came to call the not, which we'll talk about today, the non-relational mentality. And so after the publication of Why We Love Dogs and, and further research and, uh, you know, writing about healthy relationality and so on and so forth, um, I decided it was time to write a book that's similar to Why We Love Dogs, but not focused exclusively on farmed animals, you know, all injustices, right? Racism, patriarchy, um, animal exploitation, AKA carnism, speciesism, environmental degradation, domestic abuse, you know, and so on. They share a common denominator. And this common denominator is relational dysfunction or dysfunctional ways of relating, right? To other individuals, between social groups, you know, between humans and non-human animals and between humans and the environment. And, and this relational dysfunction stems from a particular psychology, this mentality that I was just referring to. I refer to this is the, the non-relational mentality that causes us to think, feel, and act in ways that violate our integrity, right? That are uh, antithetical to our moral values of compassion and justice, and that, that harm the dignity of others. And this results in, you know, exploitation, it results in oppression, it results in injustice. And so I really realize that it's not enough, you know, when we're talking about wanting to end injustice, it's not enough to simply look at who is engaging in injustice against, who is oppressing or abusing whom. We really need to understand how and why we oppress and abuse in the first place. And I wanted to, with How, we, how to End Injustice, to shed light on this 
co the common structure of all unjust systems, as well as this common mentality that drives them. So people could really understand the interconnectedness of all injustices. So advocates for humans, animals, you know, non-human animals or the environment, you know, would be better able to support rather than thwart each other's efforts to unify across causes, you know. Another goal of writing this book was to help or is to help those who are working for progressive causes to more effectively advocate uh, for their causes, to communicate about the issue in a way that increases the chances that their message will be heard the way they intend it to be. And finally, I wanted to provide practical tools to help advocates reduce infighting and, and really build more resilient and impactful global groups and movements for justice. So the book is for anybody working for a better world for humans, animals, non-human animals, um, and or the environment. Okay, thanks, Melanie. Um, I think, um, well, I, I've, got, I've got some uh, some follow up thoughts here, but um, I think maybe you've answered my my second planned question at least um, <laughs> already. But I'll, I'll 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 still see if you want if you want to uh, say something about it. Um, and, and, and so, with respect to yeah, uh, your the the re your reasons you had for for writing this book. Um, I mean, there were many reasons, but. Um, I mean, you you say so. You say this in the book uh, itself, in the, in I guess the the preface, and um, and I, I think maybe during our last interview, you you touched on this too. So you're you're I know you're you're thinking about, um, about, I I, I guess, the 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 met you you use meta language when you talk when you talk about relationality. Uh, relationality is something that, um, because it it connects in in your view all forms of injustice, oppression, um, abuse, um, uh. You, you you think it's best it's best just understood as a as a meta concept um and uh I, so this the, the idea that relationality is the best meta concept or the most appropriate meta concept the most compelling one is something that i think is 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 a little recent for you so i think that the concept you favored before was powerarchy right you that's what you thought was the appropriate meta concept before and you've changed your mind about this do you want to say anything about this shift in your thinking because i take it that um this the book you that we're covering right now is a little like a second edition of a of a book you wrote earlier uh, about powerarchy, but you decided to change the name because you've made so many updates and just your thinking has changed so much that you didn't even think it it ha should have the same title anymore. Is is that right? Yeah, that's right. And I can talk about a couple of things. I can talk about why relationality, you know, is the most central concept in the book, and also I can explain better, you know, more fully what what relationality means um, and what it is to be relational or non relational. But I'll start by um, answering the first question that you have, which is about powerarchy. So you're absolutely right. So the first book I wrote on this same subject, I called Powerarchy, and um, what I discovered in talking about powerarchy. Um, and doing, I did a lot of interviews. I think I did like 30 um, uh, public radio interviews on it and then a bunch of other ones. And I, I noticed this theme over and over again. People were getting so stuck on the term power that I could not have a conversation around that. Like the, And uh, it was all about... This is also during the um, U.S. presidential election that the book came out, so that explains some of why the conversation went in that direction. But I, I came to this realization that, you know, power. I changed the theory a bit. I can. I I had originally thought it was power. Thought of that power. Sorry, I had originally um, thought that power was really the central concept in the book, and that you know, power, how we relate to power informs how we relate. And I came to realize after having written that book and then a book that came after that, which is called Getting Relationships Right, which is all about building relational literacy. It's a whole book on relationality. Um, I came to realize that um, it's actually my thinking was uh, sort of inverted that that how we relate, period, to some degree affects how we relate to power. So power is one aspect of whether we're relational or not, or how we relate to power is one aspect of how we relate, how relational we are or not. And I don't want to confuse listeners. It doesn't matter. I don't want to even split hairs here, but there was a nuance that it, it, there was a change in my thinking. So I decided to revise the book and take power, make power less central. So there's a chapter on power now. And I talk about how our relationship with power informs 
are thinking about relationality, but I don't have the whole book focused on power anymore in the same way. But there's a, there's a lot of overlap, overlap, you know, the basic premise is the same, which is that, you know, we, when we talk about injustice and injustice is most notably expressed through oppression and abuse, right? So when we talk about typically injustice or oppression or abuse, we tend to talk about it or look at the issue through the lens of, um, uh, philosophy or maybe the lens of politics, the lens of ideology, which you know, connected to philosophy and politics. But we rarely uh, approach this issue through the lens of psychology and specifically through the lens of relationality. And I very, very much believe that we do need to, I don't want to get rid of the, those other approaches. All approaches are important, but we do need to recognize that injustice is very much a reflection of of relational dysfunction. And so, you know, when you had asked a question, or I think you, you know, had had said you wanted to talk about, you know, what it means when I'm talking about something being relational or not relational, what exactly is that? Like, what exactly is relationality? Um, and I think we can start by just talking about what I call relational literacy. Um, relational literacy is the understanding of an ability to practice healthy ways of relating. So I had mentioned that relational dysfunction drives, you know, is arguably, you know, leading driver of some of the most pressing problems, forms of oppression and injustice in our world and also in our personal lives. And so therefore building relational literacy, you know, is a common denominator in helping to end these problems, relational dysfunction. And, you know, it's interesting, most of us have had to learn complicated geometry that we'll probably never need to use, right? And yet we don't get a single formal lesson in how to relate in a way that's healthy. And, you know, when we look at the pressing problems in our world, you know, and also in our personal lives, in our minute to minute lives, you know, these are problems that are not caused by the fact that we or people can't do geometry. Like if our collective le level of relational literacy weren't so low, right, if we weren't still living in the relational dark ages, we would not vote for relationally dysfunctional or toxic leaders, you know, or support non-relational policies and practices. So, Relational literacy is, is made up of a, a number of principles and practices, but they're all based on one key formula. When you whittle them all down, you can see that they all stem from this one key formula. I call this the, the formula for healthy relating. And so here it is, right? In a healthy interaction um, or a healthy relationship, a relationship is really just a series of interactions. We practice integrity and we honor dignity. So I'm going to like unpack this. So integrity is, um, I'm defining integrity as the, the integration of our core moral values and our behaviors or our practices. And research suggests that the two core moral values that are most widely espoused across cultures are the values of compassion, sometimes referred to as caring, and justice, sometimes referred to as fairness. In other words, most people in most places in the world share these core moral values, and they are central core moral values. We want to be compassionate or caring, and we want to be fair. Um, and when we practice integrity, we act in alignment with these core moral values. An even simpler way to say this is that we practice the golden rule. We treat others the way we would want to be treated if we were in their position, right? We practice respect. Honoring dignity simply means honoring, um, you know, or, or let me just back up and say, you know, our dignity is our sense of inherent worth, right? So when you feel a sense of dignity, you feel that you are just as worthy of anyone else as being treated with respect, you know, occupying space on this planet. So when we honor someone's dignity, this is an attitude in our pra in practice. We perceive them as worthy of being treated with respect and we treat them with respect. So when we practice integrity and honor dignity, this results in a sense of connection and security. And you can just, you know, for listeners for whom this might seem a little bit abstract, um, sort of pause for a moment and think about a relationship in your life that you would consider a, a, a good relationship, a very good relationship. Chances are you trust that that other person, you know, practices integrity toward you and they honor your dignity and you probably feel secure and connected in that relationship or in their presence. Now, now, now this formula applies to 
um, you know, communication as well. Communication is the primary way we relate. One way people can sort of identify the opposite of the formula is when you think about what toxic you know, behavior feels like, you know, or toxic communication is like. So, you know, the formula for healthy relating, like most things in life is not an either or phenomenon. It exists on a spectrum, right? So a behavior can be more or less relational. Um, so on one side of this formula is our healthy or relational behavior. So behaviors that are healthy are behaviors that are relational. On the other side are dysfunctional or unhealthy, or what I call non-relational behaviors. And they reflect the opposite. Um, those are behaviors in which we harm, we, we violate integrity and harm dignity, and it leads to a sense of disconnection and insecurity. And again, if you think about a relationship just you know, in your own life, when somebody's communicating with you in, in a way that, well, just think about a relationship that you feel like it's not a good relationship. Maybe it's with somebody you've never met before, like an online troll. Um, you know, chances are you don't feel that they practice integrity toward you or that they honor your dignity and you feel insecure and disconnected with them. So behaviors that are non-relational are behaviors that harm, uh, that violate integrity and harm dignity and behaviors that are relational are those that do the opposite. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I guess it, it, it is, maybe it's pretty, uh, important for you to be clear with people about what you have in mind when you're talking about relationality or, or about non-relational behaviors, uh, conversely. Um, it just, uh, I, I, it, so I, I, I'm not sure whether, um, the word ends up appearing, um, online in like expanded descriptions of the book or not, or, or not. Um, I know that on the, uh, in the book itself, um, the word relationality or, and I don't and, or conversely, non-relational behaviors, um, these, these terms don't appear, um, they're not in the, title of the book and they're also not in the back cover description um but uh but may maybe they appear i don't know I, I i haven't looked at all the online descriptions of the book or i don't remember whether it appears elsewhere um it just it struck me that um this these concepts are um <laughs> prone to misinterpretation or something like that so like if you if you, someone were to just read the term relationality on the back cover of the book and they weren't actually to open the book and, and actually read what you had in mind when you were talking about it they would perhaps especially if the, okay so especially if the, if it's a male reader i think they're they're going to look at it and think okay there's this is a, a female author writing about something they call relationality and um and and therefore um it's about something like preserving relationships or about creating new relationships or something like that i think it, 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 is this something that you're that that's sort of on your radar it strikes me that that relationship language is kind of feminized and that because we live unfortunately in a patriarchal world and you're a female author um people are just prone to misinterpreting what you're saying because when you use relationship language am i am i right about that that this is something that you you get misinterpreted a lot and how you have to clarify a lot of the time or something um, or my way off. <laughs> I mean, that's an interesting, it, I, it's an interesting question. I mean, yeah. there's, it's, uh, when I talk about, you know, I, I would say that the, the ambitious title, how to end injustice everywhere, followed by the subtitle, understanding the common denominator, driving all injustices to create a better world for humans, animals, and the planet is, um, you know, uh, hopefully that offsets people's reluctance to engage with the term, you know, relational. Um, I can imagine that there are people who might have a reaction to that for the reasons that you describe. I would say that they're probably not the target audience for this book, though, you know, so we don't like, you know, as they say about other, you know, initiatives to, to create a shift in thinking or social change, you know, we don't, it's not that we need everybody to be a certain way. We don't need everybody to be you know, totally relational. We just need enough people to be relational enough. And I think the low hanging fruit, which is who the book it will be speaking to probably will not have, you know, enough such resistance to the term or the concept that they wouldn't pick it up. Right. Okay. Uh, although to be fair, uh, you do think that um, having more relationships is often a good thing. So long as these, these relationships are relational in the sense that you mean, right. Um, the relationships are good so long as they're um, healthy and not, not, and not dysfunctional, um, because they are an important part of living a flourishing life, I guess. And, um, but I mean, you, you have more specific language to talk about the value of functional relationships. Um, like they, they, they help build resilience among other things. Right. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I don't know about having more relationships. I mean, there's, there's no sort of set number of relationships that's appropriate for any given person. I think from, you know, what I understand, um, 
it, from what I've most recently read, I think, you know, one or maybe two close relationships is what each person probably needs. Um, but people are very different depending on how extroverted you are, how introverted you are, and so on and so forth. Um, there is a, a tremendous amount of literature today, though, demonstrating that people in healthy, you know, fulfilling relationships, relationships that are, you know, connected and fulfilling tend to fare better in pretty much every aspect of life. You know, they are, you know, more likely to experience success at what they set out to, to accomplish. They live longer. Um, they're happier. They're at reduced risk for a variety of physical as well as physical diseases, as well as mental health issues and problems, um, you know, and so on and so forth. You know, relationships help us to be more resilient, better able to withstand and bounce back from stress. And, you know, when we look at, at trauma as well, you know, people who experience trauma are less likely to experience full-blown PTSD if they've remained in, you know, connected relationships throughout the traumatic experience and following the traumatic experience. So, you know, relationships are incredibly, incredibly um, important and they are in many, many ways. And they are sort of the foundation of, as you know, we've been talking about the problems, you know, they're not just the solution, but the many of the problems in our world. I mean, we're the problems that we experience in our world when we're looking at widespread injustices like patriarchy and animal exploitation, you know, these are problems that are caused by people who are thinking in ways that are dysfunctional, that it's driving them to, you know, behave even ways that are dysfunctional, that are resulting in harm. And in this case, in these cases, you know, really widespread harm. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, well, so you, you've, you've described in, uh, in a general way, uh, and, 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 you know, you've also pointed to some more specific instances too of, of, of rel non-relational behaviors, and you, you've talked about the concept of relationality. Um, but um, if you, I mean, in case you may, are maybe interested in saying a little bit more. Um, so, um, I mean, your, your book indicates that people who behave non-relationally fail to behave in a manner that's consistent with their own values. So they, they fail to behave with integrity. Um, and they also treat others and sometimes themselves as um, as if they're morally inferior, um, which is a, a failure of, of, of respect for dignity. Um, so I, I was hoping, I mean, you, you already talked about these concepts, but I was hoping you would give some, um, I guess, very concrete examples of non-relational behaviors and explain how they exhibit these two features, how they exhibit a, a failure to, to be consistent with one's own values and um, a fail, and also how, how people who behave in these ways treat others as, as if they're morally inferior. Yeah. Um, and I should mention um, that in, when I was talking about the formula for healthy relating, this informs as well how we relate to ourselves. Um, so we, we are always, our primary relationship is with ourselves. We are always relating to ourselves um, through, for example, our self-talk. And most of us talk to ourselves in a way or ourselves in a way that we would never tolerate coming from someone else. Um, and there have been a lot of studies that have shown that our self-talk, you know, our inner dialogue is called as a, you know, a pretty significant influence on um, our, our experience, on our sense of self-worth and, and so on and so forth. Um, and um, yeah, I think when we, you know, if we look at, uh, take as an example, you were asking for examples, um, you know, what, what this like a non-relational behavior looks like in violating integrity and harming dignity. Um, let's look at eating animals as an example. You know, as I said earlier, most people care about animals. Most of us actually care about animals. We know we're hardwired to feel empathy for others, and this includes other animals. And yet, most people also eat other animals. Um, eating animals, which is you know directly contributing to unnecessary, you know, in some cases for some people eating animals is necessary and that's, you know, it's a form of survival, but for many people in the world today, you know, we don't eat animals because we need to, we eat animals because it's what we've always done and it's just what we do. It's the norm, right? And so we care about animals and yeah, we eat animals. So we're acting against our values in doing that. We're acting against our integrity in doing that. And we're harming animals' dignity in doing that. We're not treating animals as though they are, you know, have moral value, that they are deserving of, you know, being treated with the same respect as, as living beings, as sentient living beings, as say our dogs are. Um, we can look at, you know, and again, most people who are eating animals are not aware of this process, you know, that's going on inside of their minds. They're not aware of the fact that they're acting against their integrity. 
and harming the dig dignity, of, uh, dignity of other animals because they've been so deeply socialized, um, so deeply conditioned to disconnect from the truth of their experience um, when doing so. And this is because of, you know, I mentioned earlier that my, my research was first focused on carnism, the invisible belief system that conditions people to eat certain animals. Carnism, you know, is structured like other isms, racism, classism, patriarchy, slash sexism, however we want to put it, you know, these are unjust systems. I sometimes call them non-relational systems. They are systems that are organized in such a way as to increase the chances that people will act in non-relational ways. So that's one example. I mean, another example of a non-relational behavior is, you know, how many of us have learned that in order to feel better about ourselves, you know, we need to put somebody down um, or to, you know, compete with somebody to be the winner um, when we feel under attack, our reaction is, is to attack back. So, I mean, think about two students, for instance, maybe like imagine that there's a couple and they're both students and one student says to the other at the end of the day, oh, hey, yeah, I got a, I got a, I got a B on my English exam. Yeah. I don't know what you're so excited about. I mean, it's not like you got an A and then couple, you know, person number one says, well, at least I didn't get a C minus on my last essay, right? Well, at least I turned it in and so on and so forth, you know, until somebody delivers the final zinger and then the conversation ends. Nobody feels good about that conversation. Probably in the end, um, both people end up dis disconnected and insecure in each other's presence. And of course, like this non-relational behavior, you know, as I said, it's, it's very often expressed through what we could call toxic communication, you know, communication that is, is harmful very, very often, although non-relational behaviors, they run the gamut of harmful actions. You know, they, the, probably the most, um, extreme expression is through atrocities. Um, the vast majority of non-relational behaviors, you know, they're carried out in our minute to minute lives. Most of them are really subtle and the vast majority of them show up in ways that are, are shaming. Um, shaming behaviors are probably, you know, through communication are probably the most common of all non-relational behaviors. Okay. Um, so the, yeah, these, ideas of integrity and and moral worth are really central to um to relationality um and uh yeah so and and, and to, to fail to behave with integrity is a matter of not being consistent with your own values and to um treat others as morally inferior is is um i mean that's treating them as as, as if they don't have the equal as, as they don't have, as if they don't have equal moral worth um the so i, I these these it sounds simple but i, I think that when this concept of relationality and the ideas that comprise it are are probably more complicated than than they might seem at first glance. Um, one, one thing that interests me about the idea of integrity um, and and the thought that relate behaving in a relational matter is a is a, a ma is partly a, ma a matter of um, behaving in a way that's consistent with your own values. Um, I think that that probably implies that um, advocacy or activism that um, is intended to promote relational behaviors, to help people be behave in a relational manner. Um, that sort of ad, 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 activism or advocacy would be best understood as activism that is in the listener's best interests or something like that. So everyone has an interest in behaving relationally because we all want to behave in a way that's consistent with our own our own values. Um, because that's that's a matter of authenticity, right? People people are being like their authentic selves when they're behaving in a way that's consistent with their own values. So I, is I, I take it that an implication of your view is that activism that that does this is in the listener's interests, at least insofar as it, it's successful or, or something like that. Is that right? Well, yes. And um, I mean, behaving in a way that is authentic can also be behaving in a way that is violating integrity, like authentic. Really, you can be authentic and violate. You can authentically violate your integrity. <laughs> you can. Um, so uh, but acting, you know, in accordance with integrity is what most people generally want to do. Like most people want the same outcome. Most people research has shown that most people seek connection and they seek to avoid the pain of disconnection in interactions in relationships right and most people most of us want the same world most of us want the same kinds of outcomes i don't want to like really oversimplify what is obviously not a simple issue um but 
you are right in saying that, you know, when we're advocating to somebody else, and we're talking about advocacy here, not legislation. So advocacy is communicating in a way that increases the chances that a person will be open to the ideas that you're sharing, right? This is not legislation. Legislation is forcing people to change their behaviors. So when we're talking about advocacy, we are talking about encouraging people to change attitudes and behaviors because we can't force. I mean, force doesn't work. Force is counterproductive. And so, so in answer to your question, then it is, you know, absolutely people are much let me back up. I mean, think about when somebody is talking to you, they have a different point of view from you and they want to raise your awareness of an issue. Let's say that you're of a problematics of a, of a social problem that you're contributing to, to encourage you to reflect on your contribution and ideally to start, stop supporting, you know, the problem, withhold your contribution to the problem. If that person is communicating with you and in their communication, they're using force, you know, whether they're trying to force you through, um, let's say, manipulating you by causing you to feel ashamed, you know, or they're communicating with you from a place of moral superiority, chances are you're going to be picking up on that and you're going to be less likely to be open to what they have to say. Um, now, I also want to point out that like the perfect is the enemy of the good. And what I'm talking about here, like I'm, it's, I am not saying that everybody should or could ever be relational, 100 percent relational, 100 percent of the time. Like we have all inherited an incredible mess of a world like we've been born into a profoundly relationally dysfunctional world. We've inherited a mess. And, you know, most of us sort of stumble through our relationships and our communications, doing the best we can with the tools that we have, which for many people isn't a lot of tools, because as I said earlier, we haven't been, you know, provided with these tools or taught how to relate and communicate in a way that's really, that's, that's truly effective. And then when we add on to this, those of us who are advocates, you know, and who are awake to, you know, one or many global atrocities that we're working to end and committed to help ending, you know, there's an urgency to this work. There's an urgency to our message. And we know that. And many of us have become, you know, to a greater or lesser, lesser degree traumatized by what we have had to witness by the fact that we are, you know, awake to the atrocity in the first place. So we do the best we can. And I, I want to make that really clear because advocates tend to be people who are highly conscientious and already really hard on themselves and feel like they're not doing enough and they're not doing things as well as they could. So what I'm talking about here are some principles and tools to help improve advocacy that's probably already pretty good and pretty effective. Um, back to your, you know, your question, when we are advocating to somebody else making it clear that yeah we want what's we want what's in their best interest as well and when i say best interest i would say the best interest of their integrity because best interest can be manifested in a lot of different ways so for example if you are talking to somebody you know back to the example of eating animals and somebody is you know talking about carnism and the problem with you know eating animals and animal agriculture and you're communicating with somebody about this issue somebody who's not a vegan trying to raise their awareness communicating in a way that you know from a place where you genuinely believe this person is a fundamentally good person a person who genuinely you know is is likely cares about other animals it, it, look if people don't and they literally don't have the capacity to feel empathy these are probably not people who we're going to be advocating to because it doesn't make sense to try to advocate to people who are really that disconnected. But that's a very tiny percentage of the population. But when you're communicating to somebody who does have empathy, you know, then assume and you'll be right to assume that this person actually does want to live in alignment with their integrity. They do want to feel research has shown that most people really want to feel that they're living moral lives, um, you know, and start from this place and make it clear how this change of behavior is in alignment with their integrity. And then you're acting in the best interest of that person's integrity. Okay, right. Um, well, I'll, I'll I'll stop asking about this in particular for now, because later on, I think we're going to talk more about um, relational communication and uh, its relationship with doing advocacy well. Um, but uh, so the the other main idea, I guess, in um, uh, in relationality, or the other main main idea, sort of comprising 
their concept of relationality is um, uh, dignity, which is a matter of um, respecting everyone's equal moral worth. Um, so I, I'm going to do this. Is this is I'm going to be a little bit interpretive. I hope you'll tolerate my. Uh, tolerate this. <laughs> so I, I'm going a little bit beyond, I think, what you explicitly say in the book. I'm doing a little bit of reconstructing interpretation. But but I, I think I detected uh, two two different senses of the term moral worth in the book. And I think I think uh, maybe a, a defensible interpretation of, of what you say in the book is that you, you have a particular view about the way these two different senses of the term moral worth relate to each other. You defend a view about it. Um, okay, so here's here's what I have in mind. Um, so one one sense of moral worth that's definitely in the book is um, the sense that we have in mind when we're talking about uh, people's interests and the idea that their interests are worthy of moral consideration. Um, and uh, you know, uh, you and I both hold the view that any any sentient being has morally significant interests, who's and, and that their interests are are worthy of equal moral consideration. So that this mm -hmm. this sense of moral worth is an egalitarian idea. The idea is that any being with morally significant interests is entitled to equal consideration of their of their interests. But there's another sense of moral worth that appears in the book too. Um, this sense is the idea that we have in mind when we talk about uh, the, the sort of worth that one earns by cultivating virtue. Um, and this particular sense, the, the the sense of moral worth that we have in mind when we're talking about virtuousness. That's that's not an egalitarian sense because some people are more virtuous than others. Um, that there is inequality with respect to the way this sort of moral worth is distributed. And it seemed to me that one one of the kind of main or not I don't know if it's a main thing you say in the book, but at least it's something that you think and and, and defend in the book is that um, you you think the inegalitarian status of the second sense of moral worth, the sort of moral worth we have in mind when we're talking about someone's level of virtue, you think that the, inegal the inegalitarian sense or, or inegalitarian status of that sense of moral worth doesn't compromise the egalitarian status of the first sense of moral worth, which is moral worth as a considerability of interests. Um, and I, I think uh, maybe you have more than one reason for for holding the, holding this view, it's I, I I hold this view too. Um, but one reason, mm -hmm. at least, is that um, you think that people are only kind of partially responsible for the level of virtue that they manage to achieve, and so it's rather unfair to um, accord um, the interests of those who have less for, to accord a lesser significance to the interests of those who have less virtue. Um, is is this right? Is this right? Uh, am I reconstructing what your thoughts about moral worth um, accurately? Or yeah, or yeah, you more? are actually, and okay. you did a great job of it. So now I don't need to say anything to that. But yes, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, we we tend to assume people are only worthy of being treated with respect if if they've earned that respect, if they haven't violated their own moral values, for example. And and yet, what we really need to appreciate is that each and every one of us is nothing more and nothing less than and the hard wiring and biology that we were born with and every single experience we've ever had in our lives. And so, um, you know, holding people to uh, assuming that somebody who acts against their integrity is not deserving of being treated, we'll just say here, treated with respect, um, is it, it really makes no, psychologically, it makes no sense. Um, because all of us, like none of us can be any different from who and how we are. I mean, expecting people to be different from who and how they are is like expecting a tree that's been rained on, you know, not to be wet. This isn't to say that we don't hold people accountable for problematic behaviors. It is to say that we hold people accountable while honoring their dignity and, mm -hmm. and not assuming that anybody is ever not deserving of being treated with respect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I'm glad I understood your, uh, your thoughts about moral worth correctly. Um, <laughs> And you articulated them better than I did, so thank you. <laughs> well, that's uh, that's high praise. Thank you. Um, the okay, so let's 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 move on. Um, a, a sizable chunk of your book is devoted to explaining how non-relational systems, um, both uh, societal and interpersonal, are protected by three related social phenomena, namely uh, cognitive distortions, narratives, and privilege. I was hoping that you would explain these social phenomena and how they function to protect non-relational systems. And I was I was also hoping that you would explain the importance of raising awareness about these phenomena. Yeah, sure. So I'll first um, explain what I mean by non-relational systems. I, I sort of touched on this earlier, but um, you know, I, I talked about how on this formula for healthy relating, you know, there's a spectrum, um, and a behavior can be you know relational or non or more or less relational or non-relational. It's not just behaviors that exist on that spectrum. Systems also exist on that spectrum, and a system is you know in this case we're talking about you know human system or living system. So a system is uh, 
a relationship with one or more individuals, essentially. So your relationship is that your, your, you know, intimate relationship, for instance, is a system. It can be more or less relational as a system, you know, and on one end of the spectrum are, you know, what we would say are, are, are abusive relationships, right? Those are non-relational systems. Um, on the other end are, you know, healthier functional relational uh, systems. Um, so non-relational systems can be interpersonal. They can be, um, or I should say, yeah, any system can be on this spectrum. And an example, you know, of a non-relational system could be this, you know, abusive relationship. As I talked about, it can also be like a, what people sometimes call a toxic workplace. You know, if your workplace is a system that's dysfunctional, um, or it can be, you know, a broader social system, sometimes referred to as oppressive systems. Those are what I would call non-relational systems. I'm not wedded to the term at all. I was using it just for sort of consistency and clarity throughout the book. So these non-relational systems use, um, as, as you mentioned, distortions and narratives and um, and privileges to to maintain themselves. So I'll give you an example of, of distortions. Um, distortions are distortions in our perceptions, typically that disconnect us with the truth of our experience and cause us to support or act in ways that are non-relational that maintain a non-relational system. So let's look at carnism as an example. Um, you know, we learn to think in carnism, we learn to think of um, farmed animals as abstractions. Um, so this is one example of a, of a distortion, right? As lacking in any individuality or personality of their own. So we learn to believe that, you know, for example, a, a pig is a pig and all pigs are the same. These distortions disconnect us from the truth, you know, which is that pigs are individuals. They are sentient beings. They have, you know, lives that matter to them, just like our dogs' lives matter to them, just like our live, lives matter to us. So these distortions are, they dis distance us from our natural empathy from for you know uh for farmed animals um they distance us from you know our true like the 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 truth of farmed animals experiences and they make us comfortable enough to support a non-relational system in this case carnism that we would probably otherwise withhold our support from um so another example um, is, you know, objectification. Again, using carnism, you know, carnism teaches us to think of farmed animals as objects. So we refer to the chicken on our plate as something rather than someone, for instance. This, again, makes it easier for us, us more likely for us to continue eating animals, thus continue supporting carnism. Um, narratives are stories that we learn to buy into that make supporting the non-relational system such as carnism, patriarchy, racism, you know, or the non-relational behavior seem like the right thing to do, right? So like the narrative that women were, uh, you know, quote unquote hysterical, that was a term used to describe them, you know, not therefore, you know, not uh, reliable agents or actors um, was a key reason that women were denied a variety of, of rights, one of which was the right to vote. Um, narratives, for instance, tend to shape how we relate to needs, right? We learn to believe the story, the narrative that the needs or the wants of members of the dominant group, that's a power holding group, are more valid and important than the needs or the wants of those of the non-dominant group, right? And when we view our needs as overly important, we tend to have a sense of entitlement, right? We feel entitled to our needs or wants being met. And we therefore tend to perceive requests for the needs of the person with less power, you know, not as neutral requests, but actually as unfair demands. So, for example, um, among heterosexual married couples, you know, even when both work full time, women typically do 70 to 80 percent of the domestic work that's including child care. And when they ask for a more equitable division of labor, men tend to perceive such requests, not as requests, as rational requests, but rather as unfair demands. Mm. Um, and privileges are, you know, advantages that are given to some and denied to others. So, for example, you know, the privilege to go shopping and not to be stalked by employees who assume you're going to shoplift or the privilege just to have access to basic nutrition and health care, um, the privilege to have accurate representations of, of yourself as a member of a certain socioeconomic group, you know, or racial group or your gender in, in, in the mainstream media, um, building awareness of these 
you know, oppressive systems or non-relational systems, whatever we want to call them, um, not just the systems themselves. And there's a lot of awareness today of a lot of systems, maybe not of carnism or speciesism so much, but there's certainly much more awareness today than there was even five years ago about the concept of privilege and oppression and oppressive systems, you know, but I think we need to be much more aware of how these systems are in fact structured and the psychological mechanisms that keep them alive. And, you know, awareness isn't everything, but it is an important piece of ending injustice because when we become aware of the ways that our psyches essentially have been hijacked, when we become aware of our biases, you know, these distortions that have been hard, you know, like baked into us in some ways, they lose some of their power over us. Mm -hmm. 